A while back, we released a video telling the story of Star Wars Death Troopers. But Joe Schreiber also wrote a prequel, an origin story taking place thousands of years prior, during the Old Republic, that delves into the origin of the main antagonist of Death Troopers. This prequel was originally titled Black Orchid, but some people at Lucasfilm Licensing thought it sounded a little too much like a romance novel. Arg. In Germany, it was renamed to Darth Scabarus, a character from the book that you'll be meeting shortly. But everywhere else, it was renamed to Red Harvest. A reference to Blue Harvest, Horror Beyond Imagination, which was a codename among the production staff of Return of the Jedi. Anytime you would go in and try and negotiate for production facilities, people would say, oh, well, that'll cost $2, when it might normally cost a dollar. So I had the suggestion that we change the name of the picture. It was called Blue Harvest, and the subline behind it was Horror Beyond Imagination. The idea behind it was to, was to come up with a title that would instill absolutely no interest whatsoever in what you were doing. It was like, well, what, what is Blue Harvest? It's like, well, who cares? It worked until Han and Luke and Leah showed up to come to work. And everybody went, oh, I guess this really isn't Horror Beyond Imagination. I guess this is really the next Star Wars movie. The book was released on the 28th of December, 2010. And now, here is the full story of Red Harvest. This story takes place 3,645 years before the events of Death Troopers. On the frigid planet of Odacer Faustin, there was a Sith Academy. It was a sprawling, ruined structure built ages ago. Several hundred students of the dark side trained in these ancient, icy halls. In the center of the academy grounds was a black tower. It was rumored that Darth Scabarus, headmaster of the academy, experimented with clandestine Sith alchemy. Occasionally, black vapor would billow from the top of the tower, covering the academy with foul-smelling ashes. None were allowed inside the tower except a select few Sith Masters and Scabrous's personal HK protocol droid. Wim Nichter was 17 years old, and this was his third year at the Academy. He practiced his usual motions with his training blade in a class full of students at the behest of Sith Master Shaq Weth. Training had just ended, and duels would now commence. Rance Lusk the Academy's top student was rumored to have been receiving private training from Scabarus himself in the Dark Tower. He stood up to issue his challenge. I challenge Wim Nictor. Nictor's heart sank. He was far less skilled than Lusk, and the last three students Lusk dueled ended up badly injured, leaving the Academy afterwards. One even took their own life. Losing to him had some profound after-effect that Nictor knew he had to avoid. The best answer was to step back, bow out, and try to salvage any lost prestige later on. Nictor stood up and responded, I accept. Nictor quickly realized his body was under some advanced form of mind control. It became a one-sided battle. Lusk broke him physically and mentally. He put Nictor on his knees and put the tip of his training blade to the base of Nictor's skull, jabbing his spinal cord. Push yourself backward into my blade, maggot. Nictor nearly succumbed to the command when finally he broke free. Nictor hobbled out of the arena, past his gawking fellow students, and headed for the infirmary. Sometime later, Nictor went mysteriously missing from the infirmary, seen one moment, gone the next. Students in the dining hall started spreading rumors that Scabrous was abducting students for his experiments. One Zabrak student, Skopish, had a plan to investigate these rumors, but not himself. He blackmailed a top student, Jora Ostrogoth, to investigate. Skopish kept in his possession an old hollow film of Jora from four years ago, where a stronger student hazed him in a humiliating fashion. Jora blazed with anger any time the Zabrak ordered him around, but if the holovid was leaked, it ruined his reputation, and potentially his life. So he left the mess hall and headed for the tower. Nictor awoke in a small cage in a massive dark room. Lab equipment, beakers, 
and potions lined every available surface in the room. He realized he was at the top of the tower. He felt a sharp pain along his spine up to the back of his neck. When he reached behind, he felt six tubes connected to his vertebrae that led to a tank of reddish-yellow fluid. It was pumping in and out of his body. Next to the tank were glass bottles containing dead black flowers. Also nearby was a black Sith holocron. Darth Scabrous emerged from the darkness. You're awake. Lord Scabrous, what am I doing here? The headmaster ignored him, took a black flower and dropped it in the tank. The flower dissolved and Nictor's pain became abruptly horribly worse. He started screaming as the liquid coursed through him. The pain was so white hot and extreme he surrendered to it utterly. The last thing Nictor saw before blacking out was Scabrous swiping his arm across the table, sending the flowers and their vessels crashing to the floor. Down in the Academy's hangar, Pergus Frode stood alongside Darth Scabrous's HK droid. Frode usually got a first look at new arrivals of students, and it was rare that he liked any of them or if he was ever treated nicely, but he preferred the company of droids over organics anyway. But today he was greeting two bounty hunters, special guests of Scabrous. Out came Dranok and Skarl, a human and Elvanian bounty hunter. Keep her hot, Ace, and refuel her while you're at it. Think you can handle that? Fro didn't care for either of them. Sure, no problem. The two hunters were escorted to the tower by HK. Their bounty was to procure the rare Murakami Black Orchid. Before entering the tower, Drenok told Skarl to stay outside while he went in. He planned on ditching Skarl the moment he received payment. When Drenok took the turbo lift up and entered Scabrous's laboratory, he saw black flowers and broken glass on the floor. He nervously opened his own case to check the orchid he bought from a black market spice dealer. To his surprise, he saw two on the floor that looked just like his. He had been duped. Scabrous appeared behind him. Drenok tried to play off like he had the real thing, but Scabrous called it for the fake it was. The Sith Lord pried into his mind. Drenok's confusion grew into fear as he lost control of his body and Scabrous seemed to grow taller and taller. Drenok fell backward onto a stone bench he didn't realize was there. The HK droid walked back in with a silver platter as the smell of roasted meat filled the air. Drenok unwillingly removed the cover. On the plate was the severed head of Skarl, with a fruit stuffed in his mouth. Every traitor makes a meal of his allies. This is your last meal, and you must eat every morsel. If you can do that, I will allow you to walk out of here alive. Pergus had been keeping Drenok's ship warm for hours. He went back to his booth to sip some Javarican espresso, reading one of his favorite hollow mags, Hot Ships. HK came to the booth to inform Pergus. Statement. The bounty hunters won't be coming back. Ever. That ship's got a pretty sophisticated flight computer. You don't think Lord Scabrous would mind if I yanked her out, do you? Statement. I'm sure you could help yourself. He put his cap on, got his tools, and whistled under his breath as he did just so. Back down in the academy, a student named Mana Rat trained in a combat simulation booth called the Pain Pipe. It was a complex structure managed by Sith Battlemaster Hraken, who had been teaching there for decades. The Pain Pipe featured mechanical arms, whips, spikes, and more mechanized tools to drill students, with the threat of death looming over them. Rats was the smallest of his class, but he had a deep steel in him and a constant psychotic rage that drove him to prove himself. His goal was to gain favor with Lord Scabrous like Lusk had. Kraken had taken a certain liking to the kid's drive. The Battlemaster even turned the lights pitch black to hone the kid's attunement to the Force. Meanwhile, on the planet Marfa, Hestizo Trace, or simply Zo, was in the Jedi Agricultural Corps. She possessed a special force connection with plant life. An emergency alarm had gone off, 
she heard a voice through the force. There's an emergency in my incubation chamber. Hold on to your pedals. I'll be down in a minute. She took the turbo lift down 200 meters to beta level 7, a sprawling greenhouse filled with flora from all over the galaxy. Every time she walked through here, she was reminded that all plant life is force-sensitive by nature. All their voices bustled like a busy city. It was here that Zoe and her fellow Jedi could drive different species to flourish to their fullest potential. She briefly spoke with a fellow Jedi botanist, Benis, who was grabbing a cup of calf before moving on with his daily duties. Zoe made her way to the incubation chamber of the Murakami Orchid. The flower complained that it was too cold, thinking it would die. But Zoe actually set its incubation chamber two degrees cooler that night. She had been hardening the normally fragile plant for a long time now. Then she sensed something wrong. She went back into the greenhouse. Bennis was impaled to a tree with a giant spear. Suddenly, a large furry creature lunged out from the bushes and slammed Zoe's head to the floor. It was a whiffid. Natural-born killers known to work as mercenaries, bounty hunters, or worse. It carried her by the neck to the orchid's chambers, demanding access. When Zoe explained that the orchid couldn't leave its incubation chamber without her nearby to keep it alive, the whiff had knocked her out cold. Meanwhile, on Geonosis, Roho Trace, Jedi Knight, and brother of Zoe Trace, had the ability to sense recent events by physically touching a corpse. He was a force pathologist. He was on Geonosis investigating a crashed Sith warship for the Republic. He sensed his sister's pain. She was screaming, helpless against her abductor. He spoke to her kidnapper through the force. I don't know who you are, but I'm in possession of a very special set of skills. If you bring my sister back right now, unharmed, then I'll let you go. But if you don't, I promise I will track you down and I will make you pay. Zo woke up in a grisly trophy room of skulls and bones. There were boiling vats of fat, cooking severed limbs. There was incidental moss and mold that was growing all over too. The room smelled like death. The whiff had entered the room, informing her she was on a ship called the Miroka. He checked to see if his food was done, and then left. Zo found the half-crushed container of the Murakami Orchid nearby. The orchid spoke to her and was able to tell the bounty hunter's name, Tolk. Zo also realized that her presence here was accelerating the growth of the moss in the room. Her gift with the force had that effect, further reason why she was chosen to care for the orchid. She felt the ship jerk downward hard. She asked the orchid if it knew where they were going. It responded, the worst place in the galaxy. They landed on a snowy planet. Arctic wind cut across Zoe's face when she stepped out of the ship. Tolk gave her a bundle of freshly skinned furs and pelts to withstand the freezing cold. She held the orchid's container close and heard it muttering to itself in an obscure language of hums and hisses she didn't understand. Tolk put his spear to her back and marched her through the snow. As they approached a dark mountain range, Zoe could have sworn it changed shape like a mirage. She had a horrifying revelation. This is a Sith Academy. They finally arrived at the gates. Zoe could tell that even Tolk hesitated, and a moment later, they entered the Academy. Trace followed up on his sister's kidnapping at the Marfa Greenhouse. He learned that Bennis survived the attack and was recovering in a Bacta tank. He reviewed the hangar security footage, watching the Wiffid's ship quietly dock using a cloaking device. The ship's letters were scuffed, but visible on the hull, Miraka. He also noticed unique scoring on the ship that only occurred when flying through a specific atmosphere. One of the only places to find these conditions was Quen Space Station, a dreary outpost on the borders of Hut Space. He walked through dozens of different establishments, repair facilities, cantinas. He bought countless drinks and felt like he'd talked to the entire space station's population, until he met a Bothan named Gree. Gree looked up, 
deep in thought, remembering a night that he and Tulk had one too many drinks at the cantina. Tulk was oversharing information that he scored a job with a Sith Lord named Darth Scabarus to secure a rare flower and bring it to his academy on Odacer Faustin. When the Bothan looked back at Trace, he was already gone. Zoe and Tolk headed to the tower. They took the turbo lift to the top floor and entered the alchemic chambers. When Scabarus appeared, Tolk snatched the orchid from Zoe and brought it to him. Scabarus stated that he knew this was the genuine flower. It wouldn't survive without a force user nearby to support it. Tolk left the room, taking the lift back down to receive payment. As Tolk exited the tower on the ground floor, Jura Ostergoth snuck inside and took it up himself. On the other side of the tower, Rats had followed Lusk and challenged him to a private duel, stolen training blades in hand. Does Blademaster Shackweth know you ran off with two of his toys? Lusk didn't want to duel with no one else to witness it, but Rot had forced his hand, tossing him a blade, and the two engaged in a duel. The turbo lift opened, and Jura slipped into the shadows of the lab. He saw Scabarus and the Jedi walk across the room to a cage holding a teenage boy, whose unblinking eyes bespoke utter madness. He confirmed it was Wim Nictor. You are a Jedi. I am. Zo braced for a reaction, but he simply nodded. He turned on the machine next to the cage, pumping yellow-red fluid through the tubes that were attached to the boy's spine. It sent him into a frenzy, screaming with a homicidal look in his eyes, smashing his face into the metal bars of the cage. Scabrus opened the top of the tank and dropped the Murakami orchid inside. The fluid roiled, becoming incandescent, and pumped rhythmically into Nictor's body. He spasmed violently. His flesh started rapidly decaying, and then the screaming stopped. He was finally dead. The orchid had dissolved completely, but Zo still heard its voice through the force. It was screaming to stop the pain, to stop the burning. Then, the dead teenager sat up. Jura watched in disbelief as the metal door flew off the cage and the undead Nictor thing crawled out. Scabrus beckoned Nictor to approach him. The creature cranked its head at Scabrus and grinned with its wrinkled lips, so much that its mouth started splitting at the sides. In an instant, it lunged forward with incredible speed and strength, breaking off the tubes from its back. It fell onto Scabrus and sank its dragon-like teeth into his face. Scabrus threw the creature off him and sent it flying across the lab. Zoe immediately turned and ran for the turbo lift. Jura was too late to react. The Nictor creature slammed into him, sending them both crashing out of a window. Down below, Lusk was about to take his winning strike in his duel with Rot, when suddenly, Jura and Nictor slammed into the stone steps next to them. The fall was over 100 meters high, and the audible crunch of their bodies all but confirmed their death. Lusk and Rot watched in awe as Nictor's mangled corpse sat back up with a menacing grin. Nictor scooped up Jura's corpse and feasted on his face. While Rot was frozen in terror, Lusk grabbed him, spun him around, and tossed him in front of the creature, and then he sprinted in the opposite direction. The creature lunged at Rot, but he sprung away instantly. He jumped up to an overhang behind him, and the monster climbed after him. He managed to knock a stack of large stones over with the force, hitting the creature by the leg. It lunged one last time, nearly biting his wrist, and then Rot went tumbling backward off the roof, breaking his arm. He made a run for the infirmary. In the library, Kendra was quietly deciphering Sith scrolls. Even though she was one of the strongest prospects here, she looked for any edge she could at the academy, even if it meant scouring and translating ancient Sith texts. It was rumored that Darth Scabarus himself found a powerful relic here. The library was overgrown with vines and branches, and Kendra was startled when a wooden creaking face appeared in the tree above her. 
It was the curator, Dylis. This creature was a neti, a force-sensitive tree folk that resided in this library for thousands of years. Dylis warned Kendra of a sickness he felt in the wind. Though she did sense that something was wrong, she disregarded him for his vagueness. Wrong things happened all the time at the academy. She left the library and ran into Rot. She saw his injured arm and prodded for information. Was training with Rakan, got my bell rung. I've got a bad feeling. This night, everything. You feel it? Nope. Just another day in paradise. Darth Scabrus patched up his hanging cheek flesh from the bite, furious about the Jedi getting away. Her presence was key to completing the final steps of his experiment to achieve immortality. Hestizo Trace would die screaming, and he would live forever. He put on a wrist device that tracked an infection that was now coursing through his body. Then he donned a custom-made hemodialysis pump that held six liters of fresh blood. He connected the IV to his arm. The process would delay his own transformation for six hours. He leapt out of the shattered window, slowing his descent with the force. He calmed HK. Activate all perimeter barriers. Target is Hestizo Trace. I want her alive. Zoe ran for a handful of minutes. Then she heard the voice of the Murakami Orchid. It told her to crouch, and so she did, ducking behind a fallen Sith statue. She watched as several hundred Sith students and masters filed into the courtyard she was in. One master announced that there was an incident, and all further lessons were suspended until further notice. One Sith apprentice spotted Zoe and pinned her down by her hair and wrist, about to call out to the others, when suddenly a clawed hand covered his mouth. It was Tulk, and he knocked out the Sith with the blunt end of his spear. There's something I need to show you. Move. Skopish was in his dorm room during lockdown, and just got out of the shower when he found a bloody corpse in his bed. When he turned the body over, it was Jura, with glossy dead eyes, and a wide grin. The creature lunged at Skopish. He jumped up to the ceiling, ripped off a ventilation disc, and hurled it at Jura, decapitating him cleanly. The corpse fell to the floor, but then it scooped up its own head and lobbed it at Skopish, its jaws latching onto his arm. Ah! The agony he felt was unbelievable, as if its teeth were coated in acid. And then he fell still, as all sound and light faded from his mind. When a group of students found the aftermath, all they saw was Jura's head in the corner. Skopish was waiting under the bed behind them. By the time they heard him, it was far too late. Tolk brought Zoe to a rooftop where the thrashing Nictor creature was pinned by some rocks. Tolk demanded an explanation, but she had no answer. Neither knew what was going on. That's when the creature screamed, calling six other bloody Sith students to their location. Tolk fought them off with a spear from above, but quickly got overwhelmed due to their enhanced speed and strength. Zo heard the orchid again. They can't be killed. I did this to them. It was my fault. And now I'm inside them. Zo spoke back to the orchid. Grow. Just grow. Now. The Sith creatures stopped in their place. Green tendrils sprouted from their facial orifices. The orchid wailed in pain in Zo's mind, but she urged it to continue growing. The zombies' skulls exploded in a bright bouquet of leaves. Suddenly, a perimeter defense turret burst out of the ground. Its metal dome swiveled towards Zoe and fired two massive blasts, knocking her back off the overhang. Tulk managed to catch her and dragged her into a metal passage leading underground. Over in the dining hall, over 100 apprentices were eating their evening meal when the doors shut all at once. Only a couple students even noticed at first, trying to budge them open. That's when the screams came from the kitchen. Six apprentices darted into the cafeteria like voracious hellhounds, pouncing other students still sitting in front of their evening meal. The Sith creatures overtook the room in seconds, 
goring their fellow students indiscriminately. Lusk was there, and he fought a few off himself, but he quickly realized his fate. These creatures transcended death, and he wanted their power. He slashed his own wrists open, and laughed and jeered at the creatures to come at him. As they pounced on him and sunk their teeth in him, he realized the sickness had a will of its own, and it asked a hefty price for immortality. His skills, memories, and quirks that made him unique would be engulfed entirely. Even what you offer, the price is too high. That is too bad, because you no longer have a choice in the matter. Rot and Kendra took an underground passage to the infirmary. Each dorm room they passed was unusually empty. They finally ran into two other students, Mags and Hartwig. All four of them regarded each other with the usual suspicious indifference they were used to. It was the way of things here. Everyone's motive was purely selfish, careful to never overshare information that didn't somehow benefit themselves. Kendra wanted to find weapons, just in case something really was wrong. Hartwig knew of a secret weapons cache, but wouldn't divulge its location unless he knew there was a real threat. So Rot finally admitted the source of his arm injury, how Scabrous was bringing the dead back to life. A noise came from down the hall, but it was just an old training droid rolling towards them. One of them accessed a recent holovid recording of the droid. The video showed a hallway that was near their current location. Dozens of Sith acolytes were moving at a hurried pace, piling up debris to block a hallway. Mags noticed that they had weapons, one even had a lightsaber. So the four prepared to head that way to join their fellow students. That was until the droid's recording panned over to focus on the barricade. It was built out of human remains. Limbs, bones, and other viscera were congealed together by the repeated vomit of the shambling Sith creatures. They were walling the four of them in. Trace landed in the hangar at nightfall. He found a mechanics booth that looked like there was a struggle. The door hung from its housing, the chair was sideways on the floor, and hollow mags about starships were scattered about. He stepped outside to the Sith Academy proper. From an archway nearby came a Sith Blade Master, Shaq Weth. You landed on the wrong world, Jedi. Trace was skilled in combat, but Shaqweth moved with the raging blizzard around them, flawlessly executing a vicious assault that gave Trace no quarter. The Sith landed a glancing blow on Trace's ribcage and rose his saber up to deliver the coup de grace. That's when the rock wall behind the Sith burst open as a pair of blood-encrusted hands gripped his throat. It pulled Shaqweth through the rubble with the strength of a gundark, screaming before it suctioned its fangs into the Sith's cheek. He heard more screams coming from all over the academy. The night was full of them. Scabrous found Tulk's ship parked in the snowy outskirts of the academy. When HK calmed him to inform of the spreading activity within the academy, Scabrous immediately understood that the sickness had taken over. It wasn't the way he intended it to happen, but it didn't matter anymore. All that mattered was finding Estezo. He made his way back to the academy and toward the library. Zoe and Tolk had entered an icy metal tunnel with more paths branching off in every direction. For a moment, Zoe reached through the force into Tolk's mind. She saw memories of his kills on the job. When she delved even deeper, she saw faces of his kin back on his home planet. A shadowy figure appeared, gazing down at him with a bemused smile. The man was a Sith Lord. Tolk snapped around and grabbed her by the neck. The next time I catch you in my head, you'll lose yours. Zoe nodded, and they continued moving forward. They eventually found stalls with tauntauns, and one spit right in Tolk's face. He almost counterattacked, but then grinned and pet the tauntaun like a childhood companion. He shared with Zoe that they used tauntauns to hunt back on his homeworld. Then they heard a screaming stampede approaching them. The lights went out, and Tulk grabbed Zoe by the arm and pulled her down a tunnel in complete darkness. Zoe couldn't see them, but the massive force of creatures were directly behind them. 
chasing, screaming, rushing through the corridors like a tidal wave. Just as they closed in on them, Zoe drew in a breath, summoned the Force, and gained a mental image of her surroundings. She tackled Tulk into an empty Tauntaun stall and closed it. The creatures shuffled past and around them. Eventually, they moved on. Zoe and Tulk continued searching for an exit. The four Sith apprentices finally found the weapons cache Hartwig mentioned. It contained blades, armor, and three rusted lightsabers. Kindra grabbed two, tossed one to Mags, and Rat took the last one. When Hartwig glared at Kendra, accusing her of taking advantage of the situation, she turned her lightsaber on and brought the scarlet red saber down to his neck. He yelped, you need me too much. One thing I don't need is to be watching over my shoulder. That's when they noticed the smell. The barricade of corpses they saw in the video was just down the hall. When they went to investigate, they noticed the creatures cornering them from the darkness and the silence exploded into a scream as they charged at them. The students held off the horde as best they could while hacking away at the wall at the same time. One zombie sunk its teeth into Rat's bicep. At that moment, Master Kraken dropped from the ventilation shaft above, and Force Lightning stormed out from his fingertips through the tunnel, sending the creatures flying like ragdolls. They all looked at Rot, who was bleeding profusely. He heard a voice in his head that he swore was the Force coming to aid him, and invited it in. But it wasn't. It was some other malevolent entity. Darkness encompassed his mind, and it felt like a black bony hand gripped his heart. He threw his head up and screamed like one of the creatures. Before Rat could finish his transformation, Kraken put his old pupil down with a white-hot surge of Force lightning. Scabrus entered the library in the section where he originally found the Sith holocron. He only had two hours left of fresh blood in his shoulder pack. Dylus approached him. Scabrus informed Dylus that the Jedi, Hestizo Trace, was hiding, and to call to her in the voice of the Murakami Orchid, luring her to the library. At that moment, Scabrus felt a surge of power coursing through him. The infection took control of him for a moment and he unconsciously attacked the neti, biting a chunk out of its barky mouth. The tree creature whimpered, oozing sap and grayish liquid from its jaw. Dylus still accepted its master's command. It would lure the Jedi as it was instructed. The sickness was inside of him, spreading through his ageless wooden mind. The neti understood the vision of the sickness. It was a face of blood and fire. Flesh was fuel, books were fuel, the planet itself, all existed to be consumed, meat for the beast, and now he became that beast. The Neti swiped rows of hollow books he'd spent thousands of years cataloging into a rising flame. It was a pleasure, he thought. It was a pleasure to finally burn it all. Zoe and Tolk found the exit from the Tauntaun tunnels and they realized it was the way that they entered. They were back at the Black Tower now, turned around by some Sith illusion, when suddenly numerous Sith creatures came raining down from the tower, plummeting into the fresh snow around them. Tolk prepared to fight to his last breath, drawing one of his meter-long arrows. That's when Zoe remembered her brother's words from the Jedi Academy. You were taught more than how to fight. You were taught how to live within the Force and uphold the bond that you share with it. She felt a rightness booming through her, and everything slowed down in her mind. Zoe sprang into motion, lightning fast, ripping the head off of one Sith and throwing it at another. She grabbed another by the throat and crotch and launched it high in the air. Tulk's arrow finally let loose in slow motion, but she plucked it out of the air, snapped it in two, and stabbed two more creatures through the head. She ripped another's arm off, using it as a club and brought it down on its own head. Leave any for me, Tolk said, before the Sith in midair came crashing back down at his feet. He took pleasure in finishing it off. Then Zoe heard a voice. It was the Murakami Orchid, and it was coming from the library. When they got there, Tolk didn't follow Zoe into the library. 
He didn't see a point, and he told her he knew a trap when he saw one. He headed back to his ship to leave this wretched planet behind. That's when he heard oscillating, coordinated screams all around him. The creatures found him, dozens, hundreds of them, and they chased him into the pain pipe combat simulator. Tulk climbed up to the control booth and activated controls at random. The combat system reacted instantly, battering, smashing, and slicing through Sith students. But they kept swarming in, even adapting to the mechanics of the bunker, dodging obstacles before they activated. It was the first indication to Tolk that they could still utilize the Force in some capacity. He looked around and found Scavrus' HK droid standing there, and noticed it was a Circa Corp model, built specifically to avoid laws banning assassin droids. He removed the droid's restraining bolt, and the HK unit's subservient demeanor changed immediately. Its gaze became incurious and analytic, traits unique to highly developed artificial intelligence. It detected the threat of the undead now piling into the control booth, and it deployed weapons from each limb, blasting and scorching a path to the exit. Tolk and HK were two forces of nature, organic and inorganic, now quietly joining forces for the foreseeable future. Back underground, Kendra, Mags, Hartwig, and Hraken finally emerged from the subterranean passage. When Hartwig called out Kendra for an open wound, potentially being infected, they all decided to disrobe and check each other for open wounds. When Master Hraken threw his cloak off, a crooked grin crossed his face. He punched Hartwig down into the ground and bit his throat wide open. Kendra moved instantly and decapitated the transformed Sith Master. Mags took the liberty of finishing off Hartwig before he turned. And before Mags could process all of what just happened, Kendra slashed his hamstrings and Achilles' tendon before sprinting away from him. And he immediately understood why she did it. He heard them coming from behind him. Zoe was wandering in the library for 20 minutes, completely lost. The orchid's voice was now absent, but she pressed on anyway. She came to a room that looked like a grand cathedral. That's when she felt an invisible hand on her cheek, running across her jaw, down to caress the soft areas of her throat. She looked back, and it was Darth Scabrous. His face was decaying, but not as much as some of the other Sith creatures. He'd managed to stave off a full transformation up to this point, but his blood tanks were depleted. Darth Scabrous revealed to her that thousands of years ago, Darth Dreer used his first students to build this academy and library. They built a secret temple underground, where Dreer abducted students for his experiments to cheat death itself, eventually concocting an elixir through diligent Sith alchemy, whose ingredients included the Murakami Orchid. The elixir would cause rapid decay of the body, eventually driving one into a state of homicidal madness. Eventually, the body and mind would die, and the flesh would reanimate itself with superior speed and strength. The organism lived only to feed and kill, spreading itself like a virus. It could even stay connected to other pieces of itself through some perversion of the Force. Darth Dreer also wrote of the process to attain true, conscious immortality. Dreer planned to use a ceremonial Sith sword to cut open a Jedi's chest while they were still alive, and eat their still-beating heart. If the Jedi was sufficiently powerful in the Force, the final blood infusion of midichlorians would halt the decaying process, granting the Sith Lord their ultimate immortality. It had to be done at the height of infection, though. The closer to turning, the more likely the success. Unfortunately for Dreer, he failed to find a Jedi with suitable blood, but he recorded all the information in his Sith holocron. Zoe was grabbed from behind by green vines. When she looked back, she saw overgrown black orchids sprouted from the skulls of the creatures she thought she killed earlier. She tried to tell the orchid to grow again, but nothing happened. She was dragged to a rectangular pit that led to the ancient temple of Darth Dreer. Trace continued searching the academy grounds when he saw a pillar of smoke coming from the library. When he went inside, a giant tree creature scooped him up and clutched his body tight. Your sister is dead, Jedi. You will die here too, yes? Look into my mind. 
He saw thousands of years of library organizing, learning Dialysa's name, how it meant lover of knowledge. After the sickness, though, it saw everything as fuel. When Trace heard his sister's cries of pain, he broke free from the netty's grasp with the force. The netty pulled its roots out of the ground, flailing its branches at Trace. He turned on his lightsaber and slashed at the roots, causing the netty to fall over into a hurricane of fire. Pergus Frode had been sitting in Drenok's ship for hours. He recalled how he had just removed the ship's flight computer and returned to his booth when a walking corpse violently attacked him. He jumped out of the window of the booth and sprinted back into the ship. That's when he realized his error. The flight computer was still sitting in the booth, so he couldn't fly more than a minute without something going disastrously wrong. When he looked out the viewport, he saw hundreds of Sith creatures swarming outside. There was even a walking, burning tree shambling into the hangar, slamming its branches on the ship. Ever since then, Pergus hid in a smuggling compartment he found that had the fragrant residue of illegally transported spices. But then, he heard a female voice in his mind, saying she was outside, asking him desperately to open the hatch. He hesitated, knowing it was probably a trap, but he was never one to turn down a lady in need. It was one of his weaknesses. He opened the hatch against his better judgment, but it was just pitch black darkness. And then he saw, all around him, lightsabers started coming on, held by undead Sith. Dried red gore encrusted their teeth and lips. Kindra was in the middle of them. I did what you wanted. He opened it. Now let me go. And then they fell upon her, slashing and ripping her to pieces, feasting on her limbs. Pergus slammed the hatch shut and decided he could fly the ship without the flight computer after all. Tolk and HK were fighting their way off the academy grounds together toward the Miracaw when they noticed undead Tauntaun stampeding toward them. Their flesh was decayed and their torsos were tore open, carrying Sith zombies inside them. Tolk dodged one and stabbed it in the stomach, spilling the creature out. Another Tauntaun spit a bloody glob at Tolk, connecting with the side of his head. HK blazed it with its flamethrower before noticing the dozen more still coming. The droid deployed a mortar round into the middle of the herd, resulting in a 20 meter blast radius of flesh and bone raining down on them. Have I ever told you how much I hate the Sith for enslaving me here for so long? Only about 20 times. They finally arrived at the Miracaw and saw Drenok's ship crash landed nearby. Footprints led inside Tolk's ship. One last stowaway to deal with, Tolk thought to himself, as the Tauntaun spit dripped down towards the corner of his eye. Zoe woke up. She was restrained on a black stone slab, with leather straps and iron rings holding her down. Scabrous loomed over her, sword in hand. He raised it ceremoniously, Zo drew in a deep breath, and time slowed once again. Her restraints went loose, slipping out as if she passed right through them. The sword clanked on the black slab she was just laying on, and Scabrous roared as he chased her, when suddenly, Trace dropped in from the darkness above, igniting his lightsaber and focusing on Scabrous. This is over. Scabrous let out a deafening scream as he drew his own blood-red saber dual-wielding it with the sword. The two locked into a duel, as if the light and dark side were fighting themselves. The Sith Lord's assault was blindingly fast, viciously strong, enhanced by the infection that had almost completely taken him over. Trace matched him for a handful of moments, knocking over braziers full of oil. Finally, Scabrous landed a lethal blow to Trace's abdomen with the sword, spilling his entrails on the floor. Jedi trash. You're next. Zoe shook her head in disbelief. He couldn't win. He shouldn't. And as he approached her and opened his mouth to speak again, all he could do was scream. He was now fully consumed by the sickness. Then she heard the orchid's voice. Are you there, Histizo? I felt the sickness for so long I thought I was dead. Never mind that now. Just grow. 
Grow for the sake of my brother and all that he lost, for my sake. Scabarus stopped in his tracks. His rotting face twitched as green stalks sprouted from his head. He fell to his knees as the plants took over his upper body, and Zoe snatched the sword from him. She ran it through his chest, impaling him to a wall. Then she took her brother's lightsaber and started dismembering Scabarus until there was nothing left to cut up, reducing the Sith Lord to chunks of smoking, twitching flesh. As flames spread through the chamber, she kissed her brother on the cheek as a final goodbye. The Orchid apologized to her, and Zoe started climbing the sheer wall of the pit. When she got to the top, multiple zombies were waiting for her. Suddenly, turbo lasers blasted the ceiling above, obliterating some of the creatures. Zoe looked up and saw it was the Miracaw, and it let down a tow cable that she tied herself to. Tolk and HK stood over her. Thanks. Wasn't my idea, he grunted before stalking off somewhere. HK took a sample of her blood, confirming that she wasn't contaminated. But the droid stated that there was another contamination on board. The ship was rocked by two quick blasts from the Academy's perimeter cannons. They went to the cockpit where she met Pergus Frode, who was now piloting the Mirakov for Tolk. HK stated that it could deactivate the turrets manually, but only from the tower. Pergus made a risky emergency landing on top of the tower, and the droid darted out of the ship immediately. While they waited for him, another turbolaser shot battered the ship off the edge, sending it to a nosedive. Pergus hit the thrusters, barely avoiding a collision with the ground. As they flew away, they noticed the turrets all swiveled around and pointed at the tower itself. HK had succeeded in overriding them, and the tower was blasted from all directions. The reactors inside went critical, causing a world-shattering explosion and obliterating the Sith Academy. Once the Mirakov broke atmosphere, Zoe and Pergus formally greeted one another, and then Zoe went to go check on Tolk in the hold. She entered his trophy room, where Tolk first held her captive. The vats of limbs, prize skulls, and other grisly idols were all recently reorganized after all the commotion. Tolk was huddled in a corner, bolted, chained, and slave-collared. When he turned to look at her, the right side of his face was already decaying. He pointed to a lever. Mazlot. It means airlock. Go ahead. Do it. He gave her his spear as a good luck charm. Zo put her hand on the airlock lever, but hesitated. Obviously he was done for. Maybe something could be done. That's when a deafening shriek came from behind her. She snapped around and saw a Sith creature standing right there. Zo dodged his bite, took the spear and gouged him in the chest, summoning all of her strength to fling him up and over her. Tolk was screaming now too. That's when she hit the airlock. The Wifid and Sith flew into the void of space in a frantic cyclone of bones, pelts, and fats. When the hatch closed, the trophy room was empty. The galaxy, she learned, could be a very hungry place. Zoe eventually returned to Marpa. She was greeted by Benis, who recovered from Tolk's attack. They walked through the greenhouse of Beta Level 7 to the incubation chamber where a new Murakami orchid was sitting, the second of its species. The orchid spoke to Zoe. Hello there. I've heard so much about you. You were with my seed brother. Is that true? Yes. He saved my life. She informed Benis that she was leaving her work at Marfa to return to Coruscant and continue her training to become a Jedi Knight. At this point, she had given a full account of the events on Odacer Faustin to other Jedi. I have nightmares about it now. I probably will for months. And I think, what if it isn't over? What if the sickness that Scabras created got out somehow? I made a friend, a mechanic actually, named Purgus Frode. He's a good pilot. He'll take me to Coruscant. From there, who knows? She smiled and brushed the petals of the Black Orchid, and left for the turbo lift. 
She looked back at the greenhouse, the plants and greenery that made up her life for so long. The future was scary, but you couldn't avoid it any more than you could outrun the past. She stepped in the lift, took one last breath of the fragrant plant life she was leaving behind. She pressed the button and didn't look back.